Hi, my name is Bernie Maloney of Powered by Teams, an Agile consultancy based in Silicon Valley, here with another episode of Agile 5x5, a series of short videos of five to 10 minutes where we explain Agile topics. Today's topic is going to be the Scrum team and the accountabilities. And I'm gonna explain how the accountabilities in a Scrum team interact in order to deliver increments of value every sprint. So if you want to follow along, you can grab a sheet of paper and draw four circles on it, kind of the way that I've illustrated here with product owner at the top, developers at the left, scrum master at the bottom. Those are the three accountabilities in a scrum team. So go ahead and draw a bubble around them and label them scrum team because these accountabilities are collectively held within a scrum team. Now, for that first fourth bubble outside of it, a convenient label for that is stakeholders. And one of the things you can think about stakeholders is there anybody who's impacted by the outcome of the work. So that could be the scrum team itself because a scrum team can impact their own work. So stakeholders, you might call them different things in your organization. They might be a sponsor or a customer. They might be your sales or your support team. If you work with outside partners, okay, that might be one of your stakeholders as is regulatory, particularly if you're in like finance or government or say oil and gas, lots of regulated industries. Stakeholders, they're gonna wanna have input to the product backlog and you're going to want to be sure that the product owner invites them for feedback at the sprint review event. That's their principal place for feedback and status. Now, stakeholders, they're going to have requests. Hopefully, they pass them through the product owner. So have you ever had somebody, often it's somebody in one of your sales teams who walks up to one of your coders and says, could you just fit this in? It's only one line change of code. Well, here's what I tell my cutters to do is, cool, here's my keyboard. You make the change. It's only a one-line change of code. <sighs> Eyes in the room get really big. That's a teachable moment because really those things should go through the product owner because the product owner is the keeper of the vision. Where are we headed long-term? That ever-evolving sort of target that we're looking at. They're also the builder of the product roadmap. What are those product goals that are staged out along the way um, for us to deliver tangible increments of value? The chief responsibility of a product owner is to manage the product backlog in order to maximize business outcomes. Now, um, they're gonna have questions for those stakeholders about some of those requests, and frankly, stakeholders owe them answers. Don't let a, pro a stakeholder dump and run on a product owner. Um, so, because those product owners, in trying to balance those business outcomes, they're gonna pass things on to the team, and um, they're gonna need to have some attributes. So they're gonna need to be available, not just to stakeholders, they're also gonna need to be available to the team, because the team's gonna have questions, and the product owner owes them answers. So you can figure a product owner is probably going to spend about a third of their time with stakeholders, about a third of their time with the team, and about a third of their time just kind of thinking. Now, uh, product owners also need to be knowledgeable. Now, by knowledgeable, technical knowledge does help, but in my book is not strictly necessary. See, the developers are going to have that technical knowledge. What a product owner really needs to be knowledgeable about is the customer and what the problem to solve is for that customer. So, see, product owners, they're going to pass what to build into the team. Now, what is different than how? The team can figure out how to build something, but the product owner should talk about what to build. They should talk about problems to solve and let the team figure out the solutions to build to solve those problems. They should talk about outcomes rather than about outputs. They should really think like a consumer of the work more than like a producer of the work. Something that's gonna help in doing that is if they start articulating why these things are important. Now, Simon Sinek in his video, Start With Why, does some really compelling stuff about the power of why, and he uses some marketing examples and the triune model of the brain to kind of explain it. So let me do this with you. You can follow along with me if you like. So um, hold up a wrist like this. Eh, okay, we're gonna do it like this because it's a little bit better on camera. Touch the back of your wrist as you say out loud to yourself, lizard brain, lizard brain. That's the brain stem, the amygdala in the human brain. That's where friend, foe, fight, flight, or freeze exists in the human brain. Okay, same fist, let it flail about as you say emotional brain because all the emotions are in the middle brain. Go ahead and let them wig out. Okay, now take your other hand and wrap it around the outside and take it off and say thinking brain, thinking brain. This is where language, logic, and reason exists. This is where decisions get made, y'all. 
Okay. And Sinek likens these three areas to a why, a how, and a what. And he says, look, ordinary marketing starts with what, might get to a how, very rarely gets to a why. Powerful marketing, on the other hand, he says, starts with a why, moves to a how, and then the what is almost self-evident. In that video, he takes Apple's marketing at the time and he shows you how it follows that why, how, what pattern. He then takes the same language and he reverses it. He uses the same terms and he starts out with what? He does get to how, he even gets to why, but by that point you're kind of going, why wouldn't I just buy Windows? Okay, Sinek takes it a little bit further on the power of why and points out, look, Dr. King got 300,000 people on the National Mall in 1963. Right day, right time, right place, pre-internet, pre-fax, pre-cheap telephone calls. And Sinek asks, how did he do it? And he points out that Dr. King gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. See. When you give people a plan and predict, they'll work for a paycheck like cogs in a machine. But when you give them a dream, when you touch their emotions, they'll engage like human beings and like they may engage with their blood, their sweat, and their tears. You gotta ask yourself what type of an organization do you wanna work in? And I wanna encourage you as much as possible to really you know, help your teams understand why these things are important. It's gonna help them become self-directed. Now, another thing product owners need to be is authorized. And by authorized, I mean they need to have a no that sticks. If they don't have a no that sticks, if they have to go to somebody um, in positional authority to have a no that sticks, that person is the product owner and they need to be available to answer the team's questions. Oh, I'm too busy, they might say. So um, that's gonna be a handoff. That's gonna slow down the production of value. And you wanna start to squeeze those out of your system because that's just slowing down your production of value. So one of the ways that I do that to kind of talk about authorization for the product owners, think of the best managers you've ever had in your career. Bring them to mind in aggregate. Did they put you in a tiny little box like this and say, this is all you get to do? Or did they give you some really clear boundaries and say, we expect you to perform within these? It's probably this. So the conversation I like to have is how can we expand those boundaries for a product owner where they have a no that sticks? Otherwise, that's gonna be a handoff and it's gonna slow things down. Trust us, if we come near those boundaries, we will come talk to you. Okay. So really help your product owner expand those boundaries and have a no that sticks so that they're authorized. You can kind of tell product owners need to be passionate, particularly about the problem to solve and the customer to solve it for. Because as they pass those things into the developers, the developers are the ones who are responsible for delivering a high quality product because they're responsible for meeting the definition of done, which is an intrinsic quality standard. Have we built this in such a way that we could use it? So have we followed our own quality standards? Um, developers, they're also responsible for managing the change of the product over time because they're responsible for delivering increments of value every single sprint. Okay, so that changes the product over time. Product owners definitely steer what should be produced, but it's the developers who are actually producing those increments of value. Now, there may come up things that get in the way of the production of value. There's jargon for that in Agile. They're called impediments. You may also hear them called blockers. Part of the role of a scrum master um, is to support the team. A lot of people like get this confused, and they think that means the team needs to, or the scrum master needs to tie the team's shoelaces. Don't do that. You know, think about uh, kids and toddlers. If you had kids who are no longer toddlers, would you wanna tie their shoelaces? Probably not. That's what we mean by support because anything you do for a team is one less thing they'll do for themselves. The scrum master's role is manifold. They're there, okay, to teach, to share knowledge with groups, to facilitate, to unlock knowledge within groups, to mentor, to share their knowledge and experience with individuals and to coach, to help unlock knowledge. Uh, within individuals. See, they're not the master of the team. They're the master of Scrum. They are a servant leader and they are a change agent. They're there to help optimize the flow of value end-to-end -end using Scrum. They're there to help the developers, the product owner, and the whole organization get better. Um, with Scrum Masters, think of them like the coach of a team. Do they get on the field and play? Probably not. Okay. If you think of your favorite professional sports team, your coach probably doesn't get on the field and play. That's kind of like the role of a scrum master. The team owner probably doesn't get on the field and play either. That's kind of like the role of a product owner. It's the developers. They're the ones who are playing the game. Now, for that coach of a team, would you want them coaching more than one team? Probably not. Okay. 
So that's one of the reasons why having a Scrum Master working with a team really gets them in deep and really helps build their skills. Now there will come up things for a team that they can't remove by themselves. So notice how this impediment zero goes from the Scrum team, not just the Scrum Master, but from the Scrum team to outside because it doesn't have to be just the Scrum Master who does this. These accountabilities are designed to work in partnership. So this kind of illustrates for you in one diagram how all of these accountabilities in a Scrum team interact in order to deliver increments of value every single sprint. If you've liked this video, please like, subscribe, and share to the Powered by Teams YouTube channel. Uh, really comment on it, share it with your friends. That does help us. Until the next video, if we can be of service, um, you've got our contact information down there in the corner. Be well, stay vibrant, and thank you.